Good afternoon again. Uh, I would like to thank you all for creating a space where our deepest thoughts and commitments can be shared. Thank you all <laughs> for creating a space where our deepest thoughts and commitments can be shared. I need your help. If you vibrate to anything that I am saying, please feel free to interrupt. And if I'm too concentrated reading this paper, that are my thoughts, uh, please say Monica or do something so you stop me and, and uh, share your thoughts with me, please. Uh, I am of Romanian origin and uh, I'm a mother, a monk of Mother Grande Monastery and a dentist. Six years ago, I was introduced to theosophy by becoming a postulant monk at, of the monastery. The inspiration and openness that I've gained from theosophy and theosophical studies are above what I thought possible. What I will be talking about today is how I am being of service to myself and the world in my daily life using theosophical sources of inspiration. My purpose is to act in truth and spirit through service. I call spiritual the actions that support a non-exclusive communitarian existence, a universal brotherhood based on the idea that there are seven billion pieces of individual virtues that are evading more or less the truth of their oneness. One of my recurrent childhood dreams was that I had a big house for all my relatives to fit in. I used to share the dream with my brother and together we would improve the architecture of the house until it became a mansion large enough to hold the friends of our friends and even one or two of our rivals to add more spice. In no time, we decided that in order to be fair, nothing less than the whole earth with everything on it would be a good start. We never had a problem with the differences between people or with the responsibilities that arose. We were at all times ready with a solution. I now consider that dream as my first sign of self-directed effort our service. Constant immersion in our immense library at Madre Grande has exposed me to a multitude of approaches that are coming together in the process of putting them in practice. I will share the way I am meeting my limitations of ignorance, imperfection, and seeming obstacles through acceptance, enjoyment, and enthusiasm. I will invite you now to have a glimpse at the way I am going about my day. An extraordinary way to start the day is to wake up before sunrise in a gentle, joyful manner. Imagine guiding the mind tenderly, as if it would be a child, into connecting with its noble partner, the heart. It is said that one who does not rise with the sun loses an immense amount of power. Bring the brain and the heart in a state of purity, clear as crystal, and become the inner God, the sun that spreads light from every part of its being. This God has one duty, to steady one's attention to the tasks of the day as they present themselves, and not get stuck in any of them. My waking mind experiences a tremendous difficulty in freeing itself from its memories, and I find it necessary to reconnect many times a day with the initial state of clear as crystal, mindfulness, loving kindness. 
It is by being silent, gently releasing manifest associations with the last image, and waiting until the lake of the mind becomes still again, that attention is enabled to slip over the dividing line from the last task to the new one. I am stressing this information because it helped me realize that for, major for the majority of the day, my attention was oriented toward my own reaction to the task more than the task itself or to my past. Needless to say that service to myself and others is impossible in this state of complete self-preoccupation. And now I have a question for you. Have you ever had this state where you went through the day with something that bothered you in mind that you didn't even notice how the day was going? Or, and how did you handle that? Or do you think you should handle that? I don't really understand the question very well. All right. Um, do you mean that something big in your life is bothering you, and so you don't notice all the little things that? No, I, I mean, uh, it doesn't need to be something big. It. Uh, what I've noticed is that um, even little things can interfere with uh, one another. For example somebody didn't clean the bathroom. Oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Or uh, your child hasn't done the homework the way you wanted him to do it. That's what I mean. I mean something that is like breathing, something that comes in you at, at all times. Like the Persian lady didn't, didn't bring us enough food. You know, I, I, not that this is true. I mean, <laughs> something, <laughs> some, something, or your hair doesn't look good. So, yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, life in the in life, where where you're like, no theosophy can help you. It, or can I don't know. You well, tell me. I have noticed that if you manage to laugh. I have noticed that if you manage to laugh at what happens to you, or you find some kind of a sense of humor in it, it doesn't keep your attention as long, and it doesn't make you feel all crabby. It's true. Yeah, and it's yeah, a good idea to remember to laugh. True, thank you. Ken, can you? Just laughter and humor and regain the childlike state. Well, that's great. Herman, do you, have, do you have an interpretation on this? Oh, yeah. I have. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious of, uh, if you can use it, <laughs> if, if your interpretation <laughs> can you, be used in daily, in daily life, and if you can give me an absolutely, example. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that uh, is part of Jim's uh, uh, presentation, Wilson. If we create, a, if we have a lot of uh, memories, and we are not able to place them on the right place, and they drag us to a lower level than we can be, then you should uh, kill them and get rid of them. Yeah, yeah. because that I was not having time, but I had another question from Jim in mind. Because yeah. if I create myself and Wilson, what is vivid? and horrible, then I should do something with that. And some people take drugs and alcohol for it to get rid of it. Yeah? But better is to uh, destroy that image and try to replace it by something that is more advanced and grow. That is the whole meaning what we do in Buddhist meditation and the whole mind-only uh, tradition. Yeah? yeah. Where is Jim? Jim, thank you uh, for opening the road for me uh, with your speech. It was great. I, I didn't think I would fit. <laughs> what, John, can you give us an interpretation of this? Uh, I think what she's talking about in the voice of the silence is our penchant for reminiscence 
And when she says wipe out all memory of the past or you're lost, uh, she's talking about uh, the things that you normally just uh, have running through your head uh, that you try and wipe clean through uh, satipatthana, mindfulness meditation. And anything you're looking, most people when they're doing something are thinking of the things that are most irritating to them from the past. Or they come home from work and they're downloading all the irritation things that have happened to them during the day. <clears throat> and they're constantly reliving them. Uh, and therefore impressing them in the astral light. And therefore they increase the next day. Uh, and uh, you just have to stop all the reminiscence process turn around and quit uh, what I call uh, looking backwards and running into the future. Uh, so uh, I, I believe that's uh, primarily what she says. Well, stop reminiscing, look forward and uh, do, right? Thank you. Uh, the way I'd interpret it is that uh, um, you would look on things with the same wonder and joy that a little child like a baby has in looking on the world, where there is no, um, where everything is possible, everything is magical, there's no memories or learning or anything of the past that is holding you back, but you are just totally open to the experience of the moment, that it is sort of unqualified love and joy at what you are about to do or what's facing you, uh, that the, that we forget when we get older and when we become adults. That it's just a, a sense of total openness. Thank you. I interpret this as <clears throat> telling us that we need to be detached, that when we attach to something, a thought, a memory, it keeps us back, it holds us back, it keeps us in the past, the, the, it's the attachment that's the problem. It's not the, really the memory, it's the attachment to it. So by staying present and in the moment, you are like a child because a child doesn't have the past to refer to. They tend to live in the moment for the moment, whatever it is, whether it's pain or pleasure, but then it passes quickly and then they're on to the next moment. They stay in the present. And I think as long as, I think what's being said here is it's important to stay in the present and to be detached. Otherwise, you're just starting over again every single time you go back. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Sally. Well, she more or less expressed what I was going to say, that the child lives in the moment. It also reminded me of the uh, notes in the Gita where uh, uh, I forgot whether the writer was Judge or Crosby because they both worked on the notes, but he it, it calls it the turba. You're just going round and round and round and round, and you seem to be caught, and you can't get out of this, this, this cycle of, of uh, whatever you're in. You're being whirled around like in a whirlpool, and you uh, need some sort of a, a way to get out of that. What would, what would be the way to get out of a situation like that? Does anybody know Colin Wilson or something? I don't know. I, <laughs> um, what I understood from um, uh, repeatedly putting this question to John, because I, I can be a child. I, okay, if, you, if I'm upset and you, I have a friend around and says, okay, loosen up. Um, um, laugh. I can do that. The problem is, how do you get back in doing and maybe doing something that you don't really want to do but needs to be done and maintain the, the child state and combine it with the adult that where, where is Johanna, your, your wife? Nothing. Yeah, uh, because you know, she, ha she knew what to do wh when she was here. She seemed, from my point of view, I wanted to be in her team, but how am I doing by myself? Reminding myself that I'm a child and being the adult 
that has to be a leader, that has to take care of a house full of kids. Uh, that, that, and I think that's your question. How, how do you get out of the, of the uh, persistent memories of the fact that maybe, oh, I'm not prepared for that role. You are, are a child, you're meditating in the same time, and you're doing the thing that you need to do. Well, I, I think theosophy has the answer. <laughs> but, uh, I'm still discovering it. What do you think, Herman? You have a lot of trust in me, I think. <laughs> You know, the child stand for me is also another indication what is um, more important, I think. A uh, child can be looking at things as a new, not with an all precondition and so on and so on. And if for me, if you want to understand things, you have to be open-minded, not with a lot of conditions. Oh yes, that I know, that I understand and so on. Because then you build your walls around it and you are not coming to a deeper vision. Um, in, in Dutch we call that verwondering. I don't know what is the English name for it. Wonderment. Just be, be open-minded. So if you see something for the first time, don't jump immediately in conclusions and uh, this is that. Because even in my profession it was one of the great things, if we had problems, just keep open mind. Just look to it and say, and wonder yourself, what is going on here? Yeah. Instead of oh yes, it should be this, should be that, and that is with a lot of things in daily life, and that is one of the things because then simple problems become not big problems. Yeah. yeah. Just open mind, go with it. Thank you. Thank. Yes. Yes. I can do it so. The first thing I thought about when I uh, look at this sentence, what, what I learned at school, at uh, oh, sorry, at school um, about what Socrates uh, uh, kept uh, asking questions, yeah. why and why not, and what do you mean by that? And that's uh, what I think important to do, not uh, to stop uh, uh, que uh, asking questions. and. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think that's a good lesson what you find in uh, with Plato and Socrates. Okay. Thank you. I I got the idea. I got the idea. I will uh, I will try to put it in practice. Uh, my reactions are an inexhaustible source of self-knowledge. I was talking uh, to John Drace about how it is possible to be of service to others when I can clearly see I am not perfect. He said to set my intentions clearly, drop the agenda of my expectations, uh, listen with curiosity and interest to the, others, to the other person's intentions, communicate my intentions, receive their response and make my choice, communicating it beautiful, mindful of my deep heart commitment. <laughs> well, this is a, a long list, but it's working. The, the, um, this was a question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's something more than a quote. It's trying to cooperate with uh, um, with decisions that are not made by a single person, with decisions that involve a group vote, that are for, uh, we are living in a monastery, remember? So we have to, all, all day long, we need to put these things in practice that we are listening at our nightly meetings. Okay, we have a new day to put them in practice. And, and uh, we keep on asking, what should I do now? What ourselves or, the, the friends around, how does this choice sound to you? So, um, so what I'm uh, reading to you, it's uh, something similar to what the Jim was uh, caught into with extremely important problems of life that uh, uh, look, that need a, a strong theosophical background then when the emergency comes up, 
your heart needs to be there because you cannot tell them, you know what, there is a quote here from Blavatsky and that will, will stop you from suicide, suicidal. So then you're reacting with your heart. Your, if your heart is not there, goodbye. And, and to, uh, I don't know who said, uh, um, um, Nicholas said, if you don't have enough fuel for your compassion, that is again the, the theosophical knowledge, your compassion will just go down. It's, we are, I am human, you know, <laughs> so, so I've noticed this with my father. My father is uh, bipolar, for, for example. And uh, uh, with Yoss, I was discussing in our break that as long as he was manifesting inside our house, I was able to listen, to uh, take care of him when he was going through his episodes. But when the time came and I was in uh, residency in um, the psychiatry hospital and he was one of the patients, I was ready to say that I don't know this guy. You understand? I didn't know anything about theosophy or that there is a, uh, uh, another option for him uh, uh, that he is sick from a, from a certain reason, a reason. I didn't know why he is sick. I was thinking maybe we are more stupid than other people. And that's why this disease came upon us, you know? So, and I was, uh, I was uh, um, a person that was in a medical school, you understand? I had more knowledge than, than other people about the anatomy of a, of a and, uh, physiology of a, of a sick person. And I didn't know anything about it. Anything. From my point of view then, my father would, would have been better dead. Understand? And um, Jim said, it is very important to be born in a theosophical family, to hear about theosophy, to learn about it to spread it. It is extraordinary. But when, the, when it's emergency, you're, not, you're reacting from your compassion. And the fuel for that compassion, uh, at least that's what I noticed, and the fuel for that compassion is the theosophical book that you go in after your father is sleeping after like 20 m pills that he took. And, and you read it again, and you say, okay, I can do it one more day. So I think that's, that's extraordinary that you brought that up, Jim. And another thing helps uh, what John did, like prepared a group of people. My parents visited six months uh, this year, and you couldn't tell my father is sick. You understand? Just because people didn't point at him. They just let it flow like a stick in a river. That it didn't stay across like this. It just flew with all his disease and all his curiosities and everything. It, so it is important to have little theosophists all over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. good. And now I think I'm ready for the second. Okay. And I love this. I've just, um, I've just came across this while I was uh, researching for this uh, article that I'm reading right now, and I think this will make me survive a long time at the monastery. <laughs> that we ourselves can do without criticizing the actions of another. It's perfect. You need a lot of this at the monastery. <laughs> and, and, uh, I, but, but I need Ken's and Herman's help for the, last, for the last sentence, why the duty of another is dangerous to us? Or what is he trying to say? <laughs> Ken. Oh, that's why. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, no, no. You cannot escape that easy. Uh, I think in modern psychological language, that would be classically put under any kind of what we would call codependency. Oh, okay. okay. This, without elaborating a huge, long, long elaboration there. Does that make sense to everyone? Makes sense when to me. When we are, 
Uh, or, you know, in the comic joke, uh, um, someone is dying and someone else's life passes before their eyes. So that would be maybe serious, huh? <laughs> yes. That would convince me. Okay. My point of view? Yeah. Um, I think this is a very important one. Because sometimes we see things around us, what other people are doing, and then we have in our mind, oh, it can be done much easier, better, and so on. And then we start involved in their duty. And in the first place, it is taking away the opportunity for the other people to learn how to do their duty. In the second place, most of the time, it means that you are not doing your own duty. You see what I try to say? Yes. Yeah? If you start to set up some type of working force in the theosophical area or so, and you have a lot of co-workers, it is very easy to take the work out of their hands and say, now oh, you should do it this way and that way. But they have to train themselves. You have to give them space for training. Yeah? And, um, and if you have to, to help them and conduct them, you should conduct them and not doing it. Yeah? Thank you. Learning to listen thoroughly, and because I am acting from my heart, gives me the self-confidence to respond and communicate without expecting either of us to be perfect, while in the process of seeking perfection. <laughs> Our <laughs> the next one. <laughs> Can you help me? Can can you help me, Yoki, please? With with your idea about this. This quotation, I know it, and I'm very glad you used it, especially the last sentence uh, that we, with our inspirational way of living, uh, aiding souls of advanced development to descend from other spheres. That means that as theosophists, we are working together uh, many, many incarnations already to uh, make the compassion in the world uh, better understandable and more lived. And here you see that no one has to complain that their study group is so small or other complaints like that. Because if we live our life good and inspirational, then we are attracting uh, beings, human beings, higher beings from other spheres to assist us in that work. And uh, that is not uh, just theory, it's practice. And uh, we experience that, that by working really intense, that people come, whether we invite them or not. And that is a, a good uh, thought of the future of Point Loma theosophy, I think. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, while I was reading the, the Vernal Blooms, I found a uh, commentary on Through the Gates of Gold. So actually, I haven't read the book. But I liked how judge, judge's reaction on it. So it's, our cho it's your choice too. If I just put here the commentary by him as it was in, in Vernal Blooms. I don't know what this means, like pl plagiarism or I'm a bad girl or something, I don't know. <laughs> but but uh, do you want me to read it to you? I found it, I found it uh, very interesting and, and to the subject. So go for it. Okay. 
So Judge considers that Through the Gates of Gold is one of the standard books of theosophy. The Gates of Gold represent the entrance to that realm of the soul unknowable through the physical perception. And the purpose of this work is to indicate some of the steps necessary to reach their threshold. The titles of the five chapters in the book are respectively The Search for Pleasure, The Mystery of the Threshold, The Initial Effort, The Meaning of Pain, and The Secret of Strength. It is recommended that we must cope with sensation and learn its nature and meaning. We are not enjoined to kill sensation, but to kill out desire for sensation. If men would just pause and consider what lessons they have learned from pleasure and pain, much might be guessed of that strange thing that causes these effects. The courage to enter the gates of gold is the courage to, to research the recesses of one's nature without fear and without shame. In the mystery of the threshold, we are told that only a man who has the potentialities in him of both the voluntary and the stoic has any chance of entering the golden gates. He must be capable of testing and valuing to its most delicate fraction every joy existence has to give, and he must be capable of denying himself all pleasure and that without suffering from the denial. The fact that the path is different for each individual is finally set forth in the initial effort in the following words that man may burst the shell that holds him in darkness, tear the veil that hides him from the eternal, at any moment where it is easiest for him to do so. And most often, this point will be where he least expects to find it. By this way, we may see the uselessness of laying down arbitrary laws in the matter. In chapter The Meaning of Pain, we are told that there is surely no power which sits apart like a judge in court and fine us or rewards us for the misstep, for this misstep or that merit. It is we who shape or ordain our own future. God exists within each man. The physical, which makes us separate individual, must eventually fall away, leaving each man one with all men and with God who is the infinite. In the secret of strength, we find out that there is no distinction in nature between good and evil. It is by experience alone that the knowledge can be possessed and assimilated. Instead of crushing out the animal nature, we have the high and wise teaching that we must learn to fully understand the animal and subordinate it to the spiritual. So this is a, a, sh a short commentary of that book. Now, um, um, I, I have two questions. I, I um, understood that the author is uh, Mabel Collins. Is that true? Yeah. And, um, and um, a judge in, uh, in Vernal Blooms, he just, he didn't mention the author. He just said, uh, that the book is important. Do you have any idea why? Or I think I think there is quite a an, an story behind it because um, if I well remembered, Mabel Collins was having that information not from herself. Yes, so she was writing it down. And Judge was, I think, more referring to the source where it coming from. Mm -hmm than from m to Mabel Collins, who was writing it down. Yep. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's what m my feeling was also. Yeah. So it was okay with me. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes? Uh, this book was my Bible for years. This one enlightened the path. And my under what I got out of it is that there are points in no time where you can stand without oscillation. Hmm. And to be in that hole 
it's an abyss. You lose sight of everything until you come through this. But it was recorded apparently by someone who had been through certain cycles of initiation within himself. And I think Nicholas mentioned that certain stages of the Bodhisattva path, they must record it in their own words, in their own path. Okay. But I really, it, this is born out of Light on the Path, which is an incredible book. Okay. That's all. Thank you, Felix. And this one's interesting to me. I've always um, been confused when they say that uh, we're one with God, but yet I see everybody as individuals here. And I've heard people say, I merged and had this great experience or something, but it's not ever very well grounded. And um, I, like, I like this one man's thought, and he said, I'm in covenants with God, or I'm in God covenant consciousness, that we share this stuff of life or there's one self, but we're emerging as individuals from it. So we're really having both experiences. That's been a help to me. Um, so it's both somehow. And um, mm. the other is that um, the masters and all those that we're reading about in this work teach with the law, and their body is the law, is one I've read, but they guide with love. So they don't, what I've read, and it's been helpful. I'm just learning this now is they don't judge us, but they teach with the law, and it can feel severe. But that severity of law bursts the greater kindness or love from us as they guide us with love. I thought that was an inter those two interesting points were, that I read were interesting and wondered if you had any thoughts about that with this from this author. Thank you. Coming back to the way I spend the day, I try to conserve the energy through listening to my intuition. And I, um, this quote of, by Catherine Tingley is one of my favorite. To take action when difficult things are easy and manage great things in their beginnings. Do not worry, fear, or think of the results. Uh, when I get clear on who I am at my core and what my contribution is, making my contribution will give me that fulfilling experience I seek, and then the rewards will come. I'm ready for the next. This is Judge's opinion. Uh, I think um, uh, it's, uh, he also talks about we, but I think uh, one of the key um, um, thoughts that I learned uh, in connection with this is also <coughs> just to forget yourself. Well, um, I like to go on with uh, what Erin said, uh, is lose yourself and just do what you want to do. I, before I go further, I must, uh, must thank you for being so candid with us because it, uh, it gives us all of the opportunity, at least me, to see what uh, Theosophy can do for us. Yeah. And by being so candid in explaining how you start your day, I think for a lot of us, it is an eye opener, at least for me. And uh, well, uh, the only thing that I can say is also do and everything, um, and when you do it, the motive what, uh, with what you do it is the most important thing. The motive in what you will do it. That's the most important thing. Well, there, and there we have a question for you, uh, because you're Missy. asking us all these questions <laughs> now. So let me ask you a question. <laughs> and when Mr. Judge here tells us uh, to do our work well and our duty thoroughly, what, uh, what do you think will be the result of that? Harmony. Uh, you want me to give you an example? Well, uh, an example, yes. 
Uh, we, we have learned, in particular in uh, The Hague, we are working very hard, as you do, and we're trying to do our best, but the result we see is that we get more work. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, I give you an... Thank you very much, Jos. Look, you know where, uh, how I got my guts toughened to, to read this thing here? Because of your presence, of all of your guys' presence at last year's convivium. So the, the feeling, and yours too, the feeling of being in a family, of being encouraged to, to think and to feel, that made me be comfortable here not, and not be blocked. So this is what you guys did to me. And I, I, if that would have happened to me, the quantity of work involved in it would have been a, of a second importance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say that in other words besides thank you. Yeah. Marion. Marino. You're a Marine. <laughs> you, <laughs> what, what do you think about, uh, about about everything that was said. About, uh, th that's a good question. <laughs> you because, have a choice. Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind, what I appreciate very much and what's also on this slide is that you're making us slow down during your presentation. And, and, and I can see you working in the monastery, very aware of what you're doing and slowing down the whole time. And uh, okay. if you've ever been to the Netherlands, we like to rush. Record oh. this. Yes. Record it. John? <laughs> <laughs> I just, th yes, that's what I needed. That's it's, what you needed, it's right? It's exactly what I don't do. It's, yeah. it's perfect because that's how this paper came around. It doesn't come around because I already do it. You know by, why people are in a monastery? Because they don't do the things they preach. Yeah. You know that? <laughs> Good. So who teaches doesn't know it. You know, maybe somebody who lives it, and it's a beggar right there that leaves all, all this theosophy. He didn't need to be in this room. We, we could have a different no discussion about offense. it. I, I actually think that people who are in the process of learning something are very good teachers, yeah. as long as this, the pupils are a couple of steps behind. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, it's true. I, uh, I understand, and I'm, I'm just saying those things with the monastery and the, with theosophy just to humble myself really fast because I feel very happy right now so I, I think I understand where you're coming from and maybe I can share another thought the second please, one please. Um, the second one I, I like the connection between all of the quotes you have here and uh, what came to mind with the first quote that showed up uh, is beginner's mind all right you know and only when you slow your thinking down and really start paying attention to what's happening around you like the child you know, it's possible to uh, maybe switch off for a little while that the judgment that's going on in your head all the time and you start to look behind your first observation and your first judgment so you can actually start cutting through the appearances that you see. <laughs> like in, I liked very much the example that you gave of your father. You know, if you only look at the behavior, you get annoyed every time. But once you start looking behind the behavior, what's actually going on, yeah. You know, then it's much easier to, to, to bring out your own compassion. Because everybody has a reason for his behavior once we can start seeing that. Yeah. It's much easier to, to feed our own compassion and act differently. So Indeed. thank you. Very welcome. Thank you. Ryan. Oh, uh, I, I would like Ryan and then Ray Wilkin. Hello. Hello. <laughs> hmm. It's all that you want to say. Doesn't just say all. something. Yeah. It's all that I want to say. All that you want to say. All. <laughs> all of it. Oh no! No, not the word all. You want me to say lots of things, or whatever I want. Yes. Okay. Forgive me. No problem. Um. It's not enough. <laughs> no. <laughs> Never. I refuse to wake up. I'm just I'm being very ironic. I hope you can all see right through that. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, talking about work, 
I, I guess the only thing I can think of is a personal experience. I, I, I'm just going to bring it back to work. I, got, I feel like that's what people have been discussing. Um, in college, you know, I had to like write a lot of papers and do a lot of work, and it's a lot of times work I don't want to do. So my intention was to go to college for some strange reason, but then once you're there, you know, people ask you to do things that are their intention, right? Like, you don't decide to do it ahead of time in a way. I mean, you kind of did by deciding to go to college. So you, you knew that there would be lots of things that you might have to do that you don't like, and things that you like to do. So I guess the point I'm trying to get at is that um, I can remember the feeling I would have when I would sit down and try to do something I didn't want to do. And I think when that happens, and you, and you know, you, you, you get really distracted, and you, you start to feel kind of frustrated, and and you spend six hours in front of a computer screen and you, you don't really get much onto the screen. And, and, and I think when you take a step back and you think, gosh, well, I'm, I'm not doing work, so what is it that I'm doing? Um, and you start to think about, you start to get outside of yourself, I suppose. So then when I, I think when you start to even intellectually just sort of go, okay, well, why am I doing this? Well, maybe I might have like a family in the future or, you know, like, I'm the only person who's gone to college, and that's a good thing. And you start thinking about more people, and you start thinking about your professor. Well, you know, if I'm in his class, he has a student, and he has a job. I know it's ridiculous to kind of, kind of expand that far, but it's interesting that if you do, then suddenly, you know, oh, another sentence comes out, another sentence comes out, and then you start to lose yourself in the process of work as something that's more yoked and, you know, interconnected to the work of the sort of universe, as so-called. And um, I think that's a great way to, I guess, in conclusion, bring intellect um, into dissolution. Like trick it. Thank you. You mean, uh, Ryan, you yes. mean like a trick? I wouldn't say it's a trick, because I, I, know what you, I think I know what you mean, because mm -hmm. it is kind of like, you know, I'm going to use my intellect to kind of, you know, dissolve. To dissolve. But I would say, you know, it's like a trickling. And then suddenly, you know, the roof caves in, <laughs> and you right. fill the whole room with water. And then you'd so. better swim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You better swim, yeah, okay. I suppose. Thank, yeah. thank you very much. Okay, thank you. If you have a look at the word uh, work, you can also translate it by activity. And then you see it is a broader word and only connected to a profession. Then it means every activity you are doing. And if you say consciously, then you can also say that is, if you do it in that way, you uh, also concentrate on the moment, uh, the things you are doing at, at a certain moment. And you are not uh, troubled by other thoughts for other days or uh, the plans, what should I do tomorrow, and that kind of things. That uh, kind of thoughts go to the background. And if you act in that way, you can do every task better because you concentrate on the moment and the things you are doing at, at a certain moment. Right. That's what I uh, conclude from the first uh, part of that uh, citation. Okay, thank you, Ben. Can you, handle, can you hand it to uh, Maria behind you? Maria. Well, I was thinking uh, about something who was written in uh, a book for me when I was about eight or nine. And I take it with me all the way. It says, you have to look just behind your feet. <laughs> Pick up the stones who are there. If you can't, walk around it. But if you can pick up it, you make the, we the way a little bit more easy for them who are behind you. If the way is, uh, if there is something too low, you have to go down behind it. And so you find every day something what's making you glad. Yeah. That's it. And if the stone is really too big for you to put it away, you find it another day. Oh. So sometimes you are so strong, you can do it. Yeah, thank you, my friend. Okay. Hank? Y your turn. <laughs> Ray, Ray, we'll take seconds in a moment. We have plenty of people that didn't speak at all, okay? And 
Can we do that? Okay. All right. To be to be honest, at the moment I only I'm listening and working it out the thoughts. <laughs> so that's now my contribution. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Jim. <laughs> no question, just just what you felt. You you started your speech with saying that you felt that it's uh, incredible energy around here. So your thoughts on that, if you can. <laughs> uh, well, there is a, a wonderful feeling just being here with right. these uh, wonderful minds. I. Uh, the only thought that I was give, uh, giving focus to uh, was this, um, uh, this statement, doing our duty. I think that was on the previous slide, was it not? Um, I think it's, well, anyway, it was, whatever slide oh, okay. it was on is the way we um, develop self-confidence. And that is, when we do what we say we are going to do, which is our duty, uh, wh whether we do that or somebody else does that, we begin to count on that person, and we begin to count on ourselves when we do what we say we are going to do, and what I said we were going to do. So, but I thought that was, everybody said, well, how do I develop self-esteem or how do I believe in myself? Well, you believe in a person that fulfills their duty. And you do that with yourself as well. Anyway, I just... Th thank you so much. Great. Is there anybody else who would like to express anything? Okay. Oh, just one brief word. I think habits, um, setting up habits helps a whole lot. Like if you set up habits of... Uh, any skill that you want to learn, practice, 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 every day practice a little bit. Every, every task becomes easier. If you ever start a yoga class, you know how stiff you are in the beginning, but if you keep practicing, it becomes a little bit more, you're more limber and so forth. I think that's a symbolic. Yeah. Yeah, this is a very interesting one. I've always had the idea of what is a healthy sacrifice. Psychologists will say, too much stress, you know you burn out. And no stress, you don't make any growth or progress. And I was reading um, Alice Bailey where she talks about the Tao where the TAO she calls it, and she says detach and then dispassion or you sacrifice your old desires for a better one coming or that's to atone. And then there's discernment. You're supposed to sit down and think what you learned so you don't repeat the same old thing and your ego makes progress somehow. And then from that, they mentioned the AUM where you become more of an individual. You go through the initiations, you identify with God and you're more godlike or more yourself sort of thing. I thought that was interesting. Um, Buddha, I read Buddhism in a lot of different texts this last year and the one Vietnamese copy I finally found made sense on this quote around sacrifice and it, it said that everything is misery or eventually we live good until we're bored of it. Those same old desires just won't do. That accumulates in a certain way and then it extinguishes. And if we extinguish it by atoning, then we've made progress with our ego. And all paths to enlightenment, that's what they are, those four basic things. So facing boredom, avoiding facing boredom might be the sacrifice that some of us aren't willing to make as we live in these higher ways, which is to sacrifice our old desires and do some good for mankind sort of thing. And then the last one that I read, I thought was neat. I was at a conference and it's having a deep question. And I said, okay, I'll be selfless to the role, I'll be selfless to the role. And I was kind of saying, how long can you do that before you're sad for the wrong reason, right? And um, a man sat down to me, next to me and he said, well, it's also okay to be selfish to be yourself. Be selfish to be, I thought that was a good one. Be selfish to be yourself because you're not supposed to mimic anyone else while you're selfless to the world 
and then sacrifice to make progress to be an individual as you do some good in the world. So those are, that's some sharing from this last year's reading about sacrifice. Thank you very much, Ray. And Flip, F Flip wanted to say something. Yes, a little thing. Uh, first, uh, when you uh, let, let us see the quotes from Harper B. and Judge, the first thing that I thought is, who is the teacher who spoken to us? Uh, uh, do everybody, uh, uh, who is the teacher who yeah. spoken to us with the quotes? Can iemand mij helpen? Uh, yeah, no, 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 I understand. <laughs> wat, wat ik wil vragen eigenlijk van, uh, wie is nou de teacher, de, de leraar die tegen ons praat? He, we yeah. kunnen zeggen dat Judge, dat is HPP. Okay. That, yeah. I think so I his, his impression is that by seeing the sources yes. quoted from Judge and HPP, um, his question is, who is the real teacher behind it? Yes. Because where is the knowledge coming from? Who teach me by these quotations? Mm -hmm. and, and I have probably an answer. That's beautiful. I think, Thank you. I think it is our inner teacher. Not an outer teacher, but our own inner teacher. Because our, my inner teacher, your inner teacher, spoke the same language. That's not a, a how you say that, a vreemde taal of... A strange language? A, a strange language. That's good to realize that. That he spoke to us, go back to your child state. Why is that? Because we are all sophisticated. We are, how you say that, uh, full of uh, good and bad. And onze vooroordelen, how we say that? Uh, yeah. Prejudice. 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 Yes. We have all those things throw out. And then we are able to connect with our own inner teacher. And then I think I, 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 I am trying to experience that we know what we do, but we have to act. A kind doesn't know of the, uh, realize zich not, uh, hoe zeg je dat? Uh, uh, a child act. En vraagt zich niet af wat brengt het mij of wat gaat het doen. A child is acting, don't ask himself what will it bring to me and so on. But just act, act. and play and wants to do things. Yes? Yeah. Yes. And when we do that, vanaf the child state, vanuit compassion for awareness about the unity of life, yeah, then is it always good. And it brings us uh, uh, dichter by the teacher. Closer. Closer. Closer to our inner teacher. And it brings us to a state greater field of work. Yeah. So long as we think, do I good? Do I not good? If I do that? If I do that, then I'll be busy with ourselves, our lower self. We have to throw it away and listening to our own inner teacher. And they bring it, and not the teacher, you do it self, that bring you in these circumstances where you been necessary to help the people around you. You don't have to go to a monastery. You don't have to go to a hill or to the, to the Tibet, to the Himalayas. It is all in ourselves. And, we, and the only thing we have to do is to bring it out. And we don't have to fear for it. You see, I've, I've been here, and one of the things I always think by myself, why I don't teach English so I can speak to the other people? But I have to lose my fairness. I say that my, my, yeah, yeah. my I fairness for you. Yeah? I understand. I think, when, and I think probably we all, when we listen to the teachers, they spoke to us every day, every minute, 24 hours, seven days, year in, year out. And we throw all our sophisticated things we have built up, life after life, then we know what to do. Yes? Yes. Good job, Flip. Good job. I'm out of here. Ah. <laughs>